It's May 15th. Computex approaches dangerously quickly. Now, from my childhood playing Lunar Lander, I had a copy on the Commodore 64. <laughs> I know that landing on the lunar surface is incredibly dangerous. If you're off by a single degree, a single lander, pixel. it will burst into flame and the whole thing will collapse, which is weird considering the gravitational and atmospheric conditions on the moon. <laughs> but that's how it works, which makes this story even more impressive. <laughs> Jeff Bezos has unveiled a lunar lander to take astronauts to the moon by 2024. Listen, the explosion in lunar lander on the Commodore 64 was uh, basically the astronaut equivalent of the cyanide capsule because otherwise they're just going off into interstellar space and nobody <laughs> wants to die like that. <laughs> but you might have a couple of minutes to radio home to your family. Yeah. Uh, no. Just, no, just end it. <laughs> it's better you they could, not know what happened. Uh, they didn't have a video feed back then, did they? They brought the film back with them. Yeah. But nowadays, you could set the camera up and be like, all right, here we, for posterity, I'm going to pop this helmet. <laughs> we're going to see what happens. I think that would actually be worse. Like, I can imagine <laughs> that it's just it's like, no, he died in an Your accident. Your kids having to see that? Yeah. <laughs> so here it is. Looks pretty cool. Blue Moon. I'm surprised that, I'm surprised it's as large as it, as it is. And as large as it is, I'm surprised that it fits six people. Well, three metric tons of stuff yeah. can be loaded onto it. Because Bezos is saying, hey, we're going to the moon, and we're not coming back. We're building a space station. Well, I mean, if you can get some fuel from the moon, whoever cracks the nut to get to the moon first and get, like, the H3 and some other cool fuel stuff, I mean, they're going to have a license to print money. <laughs> well, that was, did you read the speech? Because that was kind of what he went into. It was kind of like, well, you know what? My billions of dollars, I recognize that this is not a sustainable path for the <laughs> Earth. In order to keep growing my riches, I must go interstellar. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go for the space riches because the Earth can't contain me. I'm too powerful. I can't wait for one of these rich guys to locate an uh, asteroid in the asteroid belt. It's just a giant gold nugget. Like, what are they going to... They're, they're single-handedly going to change everything. But that's that would destroy the value of gold, and which is the backstop for all of our currency, which destroys the paradigm. I don't think that somebody like Bezos would care. I think it would just be like, I'm going to uh, swim in gold nugget chunks. Just... Uh, Make it like build a giant golden robot for himself. Damn the economy, full speed golden ahead. Robot. Mm. Yeah, well, be cool. Now, here's the thing about it though. What do you keep that a secret and trickle in the gold to maximize yeah. the profit? Yeah, that's gonna be a tough thing to keep a secret though. Well, he's gonna land it on the moon. That's why he's got the moon lander. Well, but then the moon people, the moonanites, <laughs> are going to see it, and then you just have to start killing them. That's gonna be a great novel. We talked about Intel before, and Intel, they haven't really brought the 10 nanometer. They talk about it, and today is no exception. They're going to talk about it some more. Uh, Intel process technology update. 10 nanometer server products in the first half of 2020. Accelerated 7 nanometer in 2021. Wait, now what? 2020? Oh, no. Amazingly, the first product is going to be a GPU, not a CPU. Oh. Or at least they say that's what it's going to be, but no. we'll see. Uh, Roger Coderi was in attendance <laughs> saying things like, poor Navi. <laughs> I mean, poor Volta. Oh, 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 no, no. So, yeah, that's uh continual disappointment from, from Intel, from poor Intel. Uh, I'm lo really looking forward to this Computex launch. Let me tell you. Amazon. Now, we've talked about... People getting fired from Amazon basically by algorithm. You don't, your performance dips below a certain level. There's really no warning. It's just the machine chooses you and you must go. And we know some people who are affected by this, but sometimes you expect a person to perform, performance to degrade for a small period of time. And most workplaces kind of work around that. They kind of accept that. But not Amazon. Amazon fired the seven pregnant workers. Then came the lawsuits. So, yeah, a warehouse worker told her manager she was pregnant. Less than two months later, she was fired. Several lawsuits against Amazon show a similar pattern. So, 
I mean, it stands to reason that you're not servicing work as fast as you were because there's another human being living inside of you, a proto-human being. It wasn't even just that. It was, hey, like this woman said she went in, she went to her supervisor and she's like, listen, I'm going to be peeing a lot more. (laughs) No. And that's a big deal at Amazon. You're not supposed (laughs) to be doing that. And and she even, she admitted the manager was like, ooh, that's going to be a problem. And it was. (laughs) So, yeah, the... I, do you, if you're Amazon though, I mean, they're looking at it in terms of we've promised this to the customer and you've made a life choice that has reduced your ability to to do this performance. I mean, is there any grounds there or is that just too evil? Well, in the European Union, that would like, they're going to get a paid vacation. Uh, well, that's just pure socialism. <laughs> in the US, I don't know. It's gonna be. I bet this one goes to the Supreme Court in the end. If it were me and I were Bezos, I'd be like, "Here's a voucher. Go down to the Amazon clinic there in the in the basement. Get that parasite right out of there." <laughs> I thought you were going somewhere else, and then it was like, "No, it's Ryan. I know where. He, I know exactly where he's going." <laughs> Just what's like, here. Have a voucher for some Amazon products to offset <laughs> no, your lack of productivity. No, we'll, some we'll baby clean that products. Right up. You'll be back on your feet in no time. Yeah. Take the rest of the day off after that, <laughs> but be here bright and early tomorrow. And get to picking those products. And, you know, think about your life choices. Think about your Amazon family. I wonder if there's ever, like, the stories, like, the, the, the warehouse workers is like, man, Aaron, she was a legendary picker. And then she had a kid, and she just wasn't the same after that. <laughs> but she was legendary. She, she lost her picks per minute, man. She never came back. <laughs> Ain't nobody been a picker like her before or since. <laughs> she used to go 13, 14 hours without peeing. Not anymore, man. Not anymore. Uh, remember the Galaxy uh, Fold? Nobody does. It's no, been they, too many weeks. No, they yeah, it's it's gone. It's gone forever. Nobody talks about it, especially not Samsung. Samsung Electronics says no anticipated shipping date yet for the Galaxy Fold. Although, uh, wait, there was another article. Oh no, I think I think they announced on Friday that they were going. They had a ship date. Oh, when is it? Uh, like a month. That seems ambitious. They figured out some way to fix the fold from getting debris in it. They're, they sprayed it with some type of plastic that expands and contracts. And mm, that sounds like it's untested. Yeah, I don't. How know. could you test it for a million bins in that amount of time? Well, the see now that's the funny thing. They actually have been testing it. Like the bending machine that they had tested it for a huge number of bins, but it didn't test it in like a dirty environment. Yeah, like, so. it, it's, it didn't test bending it and then putting it in a pocket and taking it out. But if you can keep the crap out, that's the only thing you need to test. You know what they should do? Samsung, contact me. We should put that bending machine right beside my cat's litter box because <laughs> I guarantee you it will get some crap down in the hinges. What, what a clever solution. I mean, it probably would. And the cats, it would also test it for, like, scratches and stuff. Because, you know, just a moving item in their room, the cats would love that. They'd love <laughs> to attack that. I put this story in. I was telling Wendell before. I was like, because Google AMP, everybody hates it. And that whole URL rewriting thing, oh, man. Accelerated mobile pages people for are, AMP. People are, not, people are not excited about this. And I thought that's what this article was about. It's from uh, VentureBeat. But it turns out this article is just like a big cheerleading thing for it. <laughs> Google creates dedicated placement. Dedicated placement in search results for AMP stories, starting with the travel category. So the deal with AMP is that when you're looking at a search result, you can click on that. And because it's AMP, Google basically already has the content. You don't have to hit somebody else's server for the content. So when you're on mobile, because the mobile network in America is somewhere between abysmal and god-awful, uh, it you, normally takes a long time for a web page to load when you're on mobile. And so Google's been really aggressive with uh, dialing down their tools so that the pages have to be very small and light and fast. But AMP takes it to another level where Google's actually hosting your landing page for you. So when you Google something and you get an AMP result, the content is actually coming from Google. So it's very fast, but it has to fit all these rules. And so for travel sites, like what is there to do in Toronto? Uh AMP is going to have dedicated spots in the search results. And you can see why people might hate it because it looks exactly like clickbait at the bottom of articles. It really puts you in mind of that. And it's yeah. got like a little flip book animation thing going on. Yeah. And it's just like, I want my Google results to be sterile and trustworthy. 
I know you're evil, but at least you did this right. <laughs> Remember that time you did something right? And now it's turning into this. It's an interesting situation because a lot of web designers and web developers do not like AMP. But a lot of the forces that drive this type of hosting, a lot of the marketing forces, they want their analytics scripts and their tracking scripts and God knows what else. And that is what slows the page down. And so in this situation, Google is saying, well, we can't trust third parties to do this correctly. So we'll make them use the AMP framework, which doesn't do any of those things from in terms of like tracking and scripts and stuff. Well, I bet it's using Google Analytics. Yeah, I mean, it's got all of Google stuff, but it doesn't have any third party stuff. So, Can you imagine, because we've worked with, yeah. with with companies who would do this kind of thing. Can you imagine how nightmarish it is when they call you and they're like, oh, uh, hey, listen, we just need to change like five things about this. <laughs> we just need to change the font and the placement and the background image. And and, and Google already has its cache of it. So uh, then you have to invalidate that. And- oh, no, it's more horrifying than that. Uh, we had that one project where they were moving away from AMP because of all of the problems. And there literally was not a way to do that. Like at the time, Google had not built in a way to make the pages no longer AMP. So when you wanted to, uh, like, it's like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this nice, like, React responsive website and uh, not the AMP thing. And it was really fast. Um, Google was just like, nope, we're not turning off AMP results. So when you would click on that, it would just break the page. It was great. It was so great. A lot of complaints about that. Good job, Google. You can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of fixed now, but it's still it's not a great situation. A lot of people like to cancel their cable bill. <laughs> they like to cut the cord. The story was delightful. And how, if you're a cable company, how do you do? What do you do? How do you how do you combat that? How do you keep your customers? Well, just like AMP. You don't let them leave. <laughs> Charter squeezes more money out of internet users with its new cancellation policy. No more prorated final bills. So if you're moving and it's like, hey, I'm moving on the 15th into my new place. Can you cancel my service on the 15th and hook it up somewhere else? The new answer is no. You're going to have to pay through the end of the month. <laughs> it turns out they're not the first to do this. Actually, they were one of the few left that, that did prorate your cancellations, but not anymore. Get ready to pay it all. So if you're going to move... Factor that into your moving schedule. <laughs> Move at the end of the month. <laughs> what a terrible, terrible company. <laughs> yeah. It's also uh, the situation, like one, under some state laws, this might actually be illegal, not because of the policy, but for double charging. So like if you're a landlord and somebody breaks the lease and moves out, um, you can't charge them for the rent until... Uh, unless uh, well, if somebody else moves in immediately, then you're not really out anything. So there's not really any damages. So you can't like, like somebody's in a five year term. You can't really get the full five year collected plus whatever, but that's exactly what they're doing here. It's like, if you move out on the fifth and somebody else moves into your old place by like the seventh and they sign up for a new service, charters getting double paid. You're paying for your old service at your old location, and the new person is paying for new service at your old location. But what if that person gets different service? There's still if, there's still overlap. It's gonna be some kind of overlap. And those states, they probably just won't even bother. Yeah. So, <laughs> yay for states' rights. Yeah. Maybe try using them. Uber Uber had a big day this week. A big down day. <laughs> it was the IPO. Now the. Uh, the IPO was supposed to launch at $45. Now, a lot of people were saying, man, it's going to be 60 by the end of the day. We're going to make so much money. Well, it actually launched at $42. <laughs> I was one of the people that's surprised that this went as badly as it did. Have you looked at the fundamentals on Uber? Yeah, it's really bad. They burn more money than Amazon. Uh, I The reason I thought it was going to go well is because like, from a 10,000-foot view with the whole like food delivery thing, thought it was going to go really well but cnbc said that uh, uber ends its first day of trading down more than seven percent and it's only gotten a little worse since this article maybe by the time the news airs it will be better but as of right now things are looking pretty grim 4150 i think is around in the aftermarket that's what it ended up being now that is seven percent is not the most of any ipo losing money on the first day but because of the insane market valuation it is the most money any IPO has ever lost on the first day. They were hoping to raise $120 billion. They're going to raise probably about 60. 
So, mm. and still incredibly overvalued. Yeah. Still, even then. Well, it explains why they've been doing the whole like Uber Eats and, you know, all the other stuff with Uber lately. Yeah, because they're burning cash. Yeah. They also had the big Uber strike. Yeah. Which I don't know if that necessarily affected the IPO. Probably not. Because I think Uber is the kind of service where no matter how many people strike, other people are just going to jump in yeah. and fill the, the void. One guy who was striking made the statement that says, I feel like a slave. And I feel like that really downplays actual slavery. Because <laughs> it's like, oh, you installed an app. Applied for the service, set up your bank account. You went through like 12 steps to become an Uber driver. And then the, as soon as you start doing it, you're like, I'm a slave. <laughs> Not really. You got to launch the app and do stuff. You can get trapped in that situation, though. I mean, if you're in a situation where you're just barely making enough money by working a ton of hours... And it's like, I need to take some time to find something better to do. You might not have the time to do that without you, everything collapsing. But you could do that in a lot of different jobs. Yeah. You not could, just Uber. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just a bad choice. People make bad choices. They have to deal with the consequences of those choices. That's not to say that I think Uber's a great company or anything, but uh, I don't know. We will see. We will see what happens next week. That'll be interesting. I don't think I would have... Uh, I would not have the balls to play that either way. Because <laughs> it could pop back or it could just continue to crumble. It really is dependent on people. Like, the, the stock is irrelevant. How technically awesome it is is irrelevant. Uh, what they got going on under the hood, differentiating technology, like uh, intellectual property protection. Literally none of that matters. It's just what the unwashed masses think. Well, but... You're half right about that, but you also have to consider what the algorithms think. Oh, yeah. So. Well, the algorithms were written by unwashed masses. I think, the, well, yeah. You know, there probably are a lot of guys writing those algorithms who do not watch regularly. <laughs> That's definitely true. <laughs> I was really surprised about the statistics in this article. Uh, basically, everything about this surprised me. U.S. adults are spending big on video games, playing mostly on smartphones. Yeah, so the average American video gamer is 33 years old and first play on their smartphone, and they're spending big on content. So this makes sense to me because people are on their phones whenever uh, there's not anything else to do. So like on the morning commute, on the train, or on the bus, or whatever, and, and they're, they're listening to music, they're doing the podcast thing. Internet connectivity is not the great on, on subways here. So yeah, playing a game, kill time. Makes sense. But also surprising that they're spending so much. And you got to think that's microtransactions, right? It's probably microtransactions, but it's also probably the app stores. Because, I mean, it's a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. That's a lot different than like thirty, fifty dollar games. But didn't they give the amount was like in the hundreds of dollars? Well, it's over time, though. So even then, I mean, are you going to buy a hundred apps? Well, you'd be surprised how many people are spending like a thousand dollars a year on coffee when you take it a thousand dollars, like over a year. Uh, 55 to 64, unsurprisingly, Solitaire, Scrabble, and Mahjong and Monopoly for women. 40 to 54, Tetris, Pac-Man, Call of Duty, Forza, NBA 2K. Okay. Uh, 18 to 34, that's the big one. Candy Crush. Candy Crush is king. Candy Crush does not make any sense to me. Zero, none. <laughs> Assassin's Creed, Tomb Raider. I don't think those are mobile games, are they? They are. Wow. God of War, Madden, Fortnite. No surprise there. So yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. That it's not kids, and here we are trying to protect the kids from microtransactions. <laughs> <laughs> the average age is thirty three. Listen, I am super bored on that train ride to work in the morning. I've I've got to crush my candy with ever increasing precision and uh, efficiency. <laughs> I'll do anything not to make contact with the other people on the subway. <laughs> Have right. you seen the other people on the subway? <laughs> Any price. <laughs> well, here's some good news for everybody who loves to hoard data. 512 gig SSD's price per gig estimated to fall below 10 cents per gigabyte and hit an all-time low by this year end, says TrendForce. Uh, I might have jumped on the bandwagon a little early. Micro Center had one terabyte SSDs, NVMe SSDs on sale for around $100. So I bought like a lot. Well, that's the other thing they mentioned is that the uh, PCI price is going to come down to the SATA price. Yeah. Basically going to be parity. So why would you buy the other one if you got a motherboard that has the extra slots, right? <laughs> Love me some NVMe storage, especially fast NVMe storage. I don't want to participate in your quiz. 
We talked a lot about. I feel like it's been maybe a year, six months since we. The, it, but for a while there, week after week, there was just story after story about 3D printed houses, and that was going to be the revolution. I want a 3D printed house, but you didn't really see too much of them after that. No, it's like they didn't catch on. But and pretty soon, not in America, but in the Americas. <laughs> we will see them. The world's first 3D printed village is coming to Latin America this summer. So these houses are all the same, but not really. They, they painted them differently. They did a pretty good job with this. Some of this them are corrugated. It's surprisingly effective. Uh, you know what else has been popular? Not This is not in the article, but on Amazon, uh, tiny houses have been really popular. Uh, like where you order everything on a kit and it delivers it and then you assemble it. Krista, it takes like eight hours. Krista loves the tiny house. So... These are pretty cool, though. These are a lot bigger than those. So you can kind of see this is their template for the rooms you can get. And you can arrange them in slightly different ways, but not really. So you can use this little tool just to draw them in. And uh, you get these row houses. And the weird thing about it, they had open-air kitchens, yeah. which I guess only works in, in tropical areas. Yeah. Although, when it, if you're having a hurricane, isn't that going to be weird? Yeah. How do you deal with animals coming and stealing your kitchen utensils? <laughs> the raccoon comes and licks the grease out from below the... Uh, yeah. And they're all concrete. They just mix a pigment in with the concrete to get the other colors. And they all feature this uh, little, you know, covered porch area for socialization. Now, the people who are getting these, I don't know they're necessarily paying for them. I think it's like a public housing yeah. initiative. And these are people who are living in, like, tents somewhere. So... We were talking about the California uh, homeless problem uh, in the last episode. Wouldn't it be cool if you drove like an hour or two outside of San Francisco and just built a ton of these? And it's like, hey, homeless person, guess what? If you just go live here, you don't have to live here anymore in the city. You can go live there. Uh, but think about because you would have this little tight collected city where just like disease and <laughs> the drugs. The lawlessness and, and drugs. Yeah. Mm. You'd probably get like. There'd be a lot of prostitution, human mm. slavery. A little bit Mad Max, I guess. Get a little dark. I'd get them out of the city, right? I mean, mm. New York uh, just puts them on a bus to another state. It's like, this is some other state's problem. Go. What if what if we built your city and then we charged New York to take in their bus homeless? <laughs> now, there's a money-making scheme. A little bit darker. Here's another story that I put in, and I didn't realize at the time it wasn't about what I thought it was about. I thought this was more about the Linux coming to Windows meme, but it's really just about the Nuke Terminal, which is kind of part of that. We'll talk about both, even though this article missed out an excellent opportunity. Windows gets a new terminal. They're talking about, like, a terminal program, finally. Although, the PowerShell terminal is not completely awful. But uh, this is a program that will give you the command prompt, PowerShell, or Bash. You totally can run Bash in this, which is the Linux under Windows thing. So Windows is getting a new Linux kernel, which is the other part this article does not mention. Um, and so the Linux kernel will be inside of Windows to be able to better run Linux programs under Windows. That's also coming. Neat. It's cool. No reason to complain about that. You can hate Windows all you want. But they're trying, maybe. <laughs> the year of the Linux desktop is because Microsoft has willed it so, and I am sad <laughs> on the inside. I don't think... I think, the again, that, that Venn diagram of like people willing to use Linux under Windows versus people who will just switch to Linux. I think... I think the average Windows user isn't going to know about this. Or care. And the average person who wants to use... Bash is just going to use Linux. That's probably true. Uh, maybe at work if you have to use Windows. Maybe for those people. I mean, of course, if you're a person who's learning Windows and learning to use the command line, having Bash in there is going to make everything so much better. <laughs> Although, I think if you were somebody starting out from scratch and you got the old DOS-style command windows and Bash and PowerShell, you're just going to be sitting there thinking, WTF, how did we get in this situation? All of these things have <laughs> yeah. similar commands, but they're different, and things don't work exactly the same. Yeah, it is going to be a little weird. <laughs> and you're going to get used to, you know, uh, which way are the slashes going to go? <laughs> it's literally both ways that's, now. That's going to be a question, right? <laughs> <laughs> the slashes literally go both ways. Oh, no. <laughs> hey, that's the modern way, right? <laughs> Apple. We don't judge. Apple has been caught 
What we do about OS is we don't about sexuality. <laughs> Apple has been caught in a bit of a lie, according to an adv- advocacy group. Apple is vastly exaggerating iPhone battery life claims, according to a UK advocacy group. So I saw a couple different takes on this, and I'm not sure what to make. This, this article goes into... Uh, Apple battery testing and testing methodology and like what do the numbers say but I was looking at like I was I pulled up Samsung for a comparison and so in the disclosures that Apple has for like their applications and how they do their battery life testing Apple seems to be a lot more thorough than when Samsung's advertising say like the S9 or the S10 because it's like here's the testing that we did and the competitive competing phone and the applications that we used and the screen brightness and all that kind of stuff. Both of them disclose some information, but it seemed like Apple was disclosing a lot more information than Samsung. That was their excuse. They're like, "Hey, testing environments are different." I could explain it. Although, according to this group, the XR, which was the worst offender, was a 51% difference in the advertised versus actual talk time. There are um, a couple things that would make a big difference in that. Like the whole Intel versus Qualcomm modem, that's going to make a 30% difference. And, well, you got to think that inside Apple's testing room, they're connecting to their own access point, yeah. which is next door. Yeah, the wireless connection is going to be right there. So it's not going to re- require right. the radio to operate at really high levels. I think there's a lot of details like that that probably matter. This is purely anecdotal as well, but it seems like Apple batteries age much worse than competing batteries. And so, like, after six months, you have a noticeable decline in battery life if you charge and recharge, like, you discharge completely and recharge basically every day. But when you advertise your battery life, should you ha- should it have to be the that amortization built into it? Because I'm sure it's off the, it's today. Right, like that's what you advertise. Yeah, today's battery life. Yeah, so. I don't know. It, it is interesting that the different batteries age at different rates because it seems just again anecdotal evidence, but it seems like the larger batteries and some of the larger handsets age much better than the smaller handsets. And Apple Apple handsets seem to just eat mm-hmm. the battery like crazy. And it's probably not. Does Apple let the carriers do the bloatware like they do with Android? No. So that wouldn't be a factor. But with Android, that's got to be a huge factor. Yeah. It's like, oh, Facebook is running, eating my battery constantly. Uh, Thanks, Facebook. This one is interesting because uh, it's tangentially related to technology, but the poster itself. I thought it was ironic. I, like, I was expecting there to be a punchline here. There's no punchline. It references video games, which now we've learned that this would be the target audience for video games, right? Because 33 and up. But... Uh, Delta doesn't want you to unionize, and what is their excuse? <laughs> Delta Airlines told staff, don't unionize, buy video games. No, and literally, that's the poster they put up. Union dues cost around $700 a year. A new video game system is about, with, with some games costs the same. You should do that instead of joining. It's just, really? Like, who thought this was a good idea? <laughs> it's so patronizing. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, people have cried foul. As they should have. Uh, whether you're pro or uh, anti-union, this was a stupid idea. Yeah. Uh, so, this is a, it's not just the inside the plane people. It's like machinists and I think uh, mechanics maybe. Aerospace workers. So, they're trying to unionize. And Delta doesn't like the sound of that. This is, uh, we talk about, of course, we talk about charter. We talk about cable cutting and it's 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 biting them. Of course, that one turned out to be uh, internet access. But when people cancel their cable TV, these companies want to do everything they can to stop it because they know you're never coming back. You're probably not even shopping around. You're just done. Yeah. And it's getting worse. Now we have some new numbers. Dire new figures show the cable industry is now losing 14,000 subscribers every day. That's a lot. 14,000 a day. That I, doesn't seem lot. like enough. Well, I mean, <laughs> how many cable subscribers do you think there are in the U.S.? Is this worldwide or U.S.? I think this is U.S. U.S., I think. Might be North America. Either way, 14,000 a day is an attrition rate that... <laughs> I mean, because you got to think the average contract is, uh, what, like... 75 a month, maybe 65 a month. 
Well, the cost proposition there is way off. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out because look at the cost of a box set. Like, suppose, you know, your favorite TV show, like season one of like your favorite TV show or whatever, it's like $20. If you are, if you stop paying cable TV, and I think we learned from, you know, doing this on the level one news that most people's cable, cable TV bills like a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars a month. You could get a lot of box sets every month and still come out ahead. Yeah. And, but I'm saying as high as it is, multiply that by 14,000 per day yeah. and you're losing that a month. Yeah. That is a lot of money. And this is the industry that literally just went through a bunch of buyouts and mergers that cost billions of dollars. And so somebody is going to get paid on those buyouts. So not only do you have to have kept your old business running at status quo, but you somehow have to make more money on it with that many subscribers leaving. There's simply no way to do that. Well, you charge more and you destroy the alternative, which is your internet access. Yes. And you chop that up into little pieces. Necessarily, you would have to destroy the internet access part of it. And you create some sort of microtransaction, fast lane <laughs> type of deal. And you, you, here's the important part you invest in lobbying the government. I like how at no point where neither of us are discussing investing in infrastructure or making the infrastructure better because there's just not enough money to do that. Because you can literally let it go for a month and nobody cares. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Uh, let's switch over to talking about some robots and some artificial intelligence. And uh, Next Web believes that artificial intelligence is going to be the new wave of entertainers. AI avatars could be the next generation's favorite entertainers. Yeah, you said that. Sorry, I didn't realize we switched roles there. My bad. More uh, personality than your average Instagram thought, right? So, some hilariously brilliant person, like I was going to, I realize how sad this is. Some hilariously brilliant person has taken uh, the best of Reddit subreddit and written a bot to go through all of those threads. And it's literally just a text-to-speech engine that reads the comments, and it but it highlights as it reads... And then, like, the punchline's there somewhere, so you can't read ahead of the the terrible text-to-speech voice. But it's, like, in the middle of the screen, it's very formulaic. It looks, it's decent for generated, but it's in the middle of the screen. But it's just text-to-speech, and it reads the thing, and why it's funny, and why it was, like, super upvoted. And so, because it was super upvoted, it is is actually funny. And then it just does the robot chicken thing, where it's, like, you change the channel, and then it just does the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And it's just ten minutes of that at a time. And those videos have like half a million views, a million views. It's completely insane. And it's totally bought. Like it's, it, it is presented by a bot, not even AI, just a bot. Well, we don't have a lot of this here, but in China, I got a couple of videos here that will show, and this is really picking up steam in China. Yeah. People seem to accept it. They have, uh, this was like, a some sort of variety show or something, I think. And then they've got these, uh, something to do with these pop groups and some of these are ai maybe <laughs> I, I didn't i didn't go i didn't watch the videos i'm gonna be honest with you but they're talking about how the younger generation is becoming more and more comfortable yeah. with having ai as the thing that they love and you know i mean it's not wildly different i guess than like a cartoon i'm thinking about back to my childhood and lots of awkward conversations and having to learn about bathing and hygiene and stuff. I think I would have rather learned about all that from AI. <laughs> we had Teddy Ruxpin, remember him? <laughs> yeah, Teddy Ruxpin's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now, but remember they, uh, some psychologists were warning against letting your children, uh, for example, just spend all their time with Alexa. Yes. Because that was becoming a thing. Yeah, that could end badly. So you got to wonder, uh, you know, it's going to get weird. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I don't know. Why not? Why not see what see what happens? Can it get worse than it is now? <laughs> Probably not. So you mentioned artificial intelligence and or just a bot and the people coming up with clever ways to use them. Because that's the thing about it, right? Like these the, these adversarial networks and all of the AI stuff, it's incredibly powerful, but it's kind of like a 3D printer. Yeah. What are you going to do with it? You got to come up with some novel idea and it's surprisingly hard to do. This guy came up with a good one. Uh, no, oh, it's a, it's a, it was a, it was a girl, I think. Oh, was it? I think so. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, neural net names, re, re, 
uh, well, I've already messed it up. A neural net names racehorses. We covered this before. Uh, last week or the week before, we mentioned that a neural net did this, but this is the actual blog post from the person that did it. And the great thing about this is they came up with uh, a horse image network. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just horrifying. To go along with it. Now, these are some that are like pretty realistic. Uh, North Storm, you know, Desert Cat. These, I like I like some of the ones that she didn't like or that the, the author didn't didn't like. Well, that's the next two. <laughs> so, but these are, you could totally, like... Lord Power. Horses have weird names. Frisky Joe. That's part of the... One of the things I like about Kentucky Derby, for example, is how that announcer has to be dead serious about some of those stupid <laughs> names. And well, it's Frisky Joe down to the nine. Because it's just, yeah, just people... <laughs> And here's where we get into the adversarial network. This was a, this was supposed to be a horse and buggy. Well, that was she. Uh, I think it was the. There's no image set of just horses. It's it's horses and buggies, and so that had to be like <laughs> blended together that way. <laughs> and then we get down into the like. Okay, these are kind of weird. Which snow motion is a good one, I think. Yeah, especially if you have a white horse. Uh, Orca Shuffleston. Not. I like I like Pick's liver, Rapple Musty. I mean, not those aren't bad. terrible. These are more weird than anything. But then you get into the third tier. <laughs> also, these terrifying <laughs> images. Fart hand. <laughs> Party can also I think is a pretty good one. Yeah. Party can. Devil Tina. Snuckles. Mister Fact. Not. I mean, if you're going to name a pet, any pet actually, you couldn't. <laughs> Could, snuckles could engagement challenge did you name one of your pets They're snuckles <laughs> i love those images uh but that is again just a, a great thing to do with artificial intelligence yeah. why not because you've got this old you got a data set that goes back how many years we've been racing horses forever and they've been you know carefully marking the bloodlines it's amazing how well horse genealogy is kept far better than humans <laughs> Going back far enough, yeah. It's because you can make a lot of money on those horses. Oh, yeah. And uh cool thing to do with AI. Hard to think of. So kudos to that person whose gender I'm not sure of. I, I, I even read a thing that said somewhere they were digging up, man, or they were trying to get clearance to dig up Man of War to get some DNA so they could introduce the, the defect that makes the giant horse heart. No, that can't end badly. <laughs> we talked about last week of the story, uh, the 97 Derby winner, they're selling his poop on eBay <laughs> for 200 bucks. Two hundred bucks per poop. <laughs> Extract the DNA. Just what do you? It's like I put that on my wall. It's like, oh, well, I think he's the... still alive. <laughs> I don't think this is preserved poop. I think he's pooping currently. Do people just frame that and stick it on a wall. I don't know what you do with it. Maybe a paperweight. Well, we've talked about uh, facial recognition uh, last week. We talked about facial recognition in American policing and some of the weird things that can happen with it and false positives that can really ruin your life. Uh, there was that kid who. He had a uh, he had an ID that was a non photo ID, and he used it to get into the Apple Store because I guess you have to give him an ID to get into the Apple Store. And then somebody stole his identity, and that was the only marriage of face to identity that they had was the facial recognition from the Apple Store and his non photo ID. So from that point on, he was associated with that criminal for the rest of his life, <laughs> and they wouldn't let him back into the Apple Store. Wow! And you got to think that that kind of thing is definitely going to happen here. New data on London Metro Police facial recognition shows it's still wrong 96% of the time. Who could have predicted? Level 1. That's 96% true. of the time. And then later they admit that in a smaller time scale, 100% wrong. Yeah. But they keep using it. Yeah. Well, if it's hard for people to tell people apart on a large enough scale... AI is going to not perform at superhuman levels for at least a few generations. Yeah. And the best excuse they could have in terms of why would you be using this if it's wrong all the time is they said it's led to eight whole arrests. Eight criminals are off the street. How much do you think that costs per arrest? Well, I mean, if you arrested everybody, at least some of those people will actually be criminals. And they do talk about... They will just shake you down once it tags you and make sure that you're you. Algorithmic probable cause. That seems like a bad, bad day for the Supreme Court. That's going to be one of those uh, TV shows like CIS and, or CSI and NCIS. And that's <laughs> APB. <laughs> this week on APB. <laughs> oh, the last story. 
And it's an exciting one. Now, let me ask you this question. I'm going to ask it of the audience as well. So pause the video, put your answer below. What does the Hellfire Missile and Krista have in common? <laughs> hmm? uh, they both attend a lot of weddings. <laughs> Drones used missiles with a knife warhead to take out single terrorist targets. So it's a Hellfire missile with a spring-loaded blade to minimize collateral damage. Why, you ask? Well, it's because of those weddings and other unfortunate public events in the Middle East to get <laughs> missiles dropped on them pretty regularly. And so the U.S. military looked at that and they was like, should we stop doing that? And someone was like, no, just take the warhead out and put some big giant bl swords in it. We'll kill them <laughs> one at a time, you know, maybe two or three. But we, we won't have that PR debacle of, you know, like the burnt wedding dress in a, <laughs> in a field of glass. <laughs> So they came up with this thing, and uh, you can see they actually used it. Oh, where's the picture? It's right there. Right. Yeah. No, that's a two by four. Oh. That's not a missile. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a comment. The other article had a picture. It was a Kia with uh, like a big four bladed hole in the roof. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Wow. So this thing, the idea is we're going after individuals. This is you know the war on terror, and we're trying to get one guy. So instead of blowing up a whole marketplace or a wedding or whatever, they, this thing just four blades spring out of it at the last moment and kill one guy. I wish Futurama were still on the air because this would be a great piece of lore for how Roberto came to be. It's like we just drop Roberto on weddings and he finds and stabs the right, the right party. But here's the, the question that immediately came to my mind. Uh, I don't remember the – I have looked at the numbers. I don't remember what they are. But the cost of one Hellfire missile is – outrageous yeah it's like a hundred thousand dollars or something yeah so how important are these targets we just want to make sure that we're dropping a hundred thousand dollar sword <laughs> out of the sky to take them out <laughs> seems wasteful can you imagine if we'd had this kind of technology to deal with like the white walkers <laughs> you mean in American history when Washington had to fight the White Walkers? Yeah. yeah. Would have come out different, probably. Good thing we won anyway. All right, that's all we got for this week. Oh.